For the past few weeks, we've been on the road with Jesus, trying to follow him wherever he goes in Luke's gospel, listening to whatever he says, and trying our best to do it. In today's reading from Luke chapter 11, we are told that Jesus was praying in a certain place. And as I read that passage over and over again last week, I was struck by the obvious truth that Jesus prayed, that he prayed a lot, that he prayed everywhere he went all the time, even if he was on his way purposefully toward Jerusalem. And it made me think that if we are going to be good and faithful followers of his, then we too must learn how to pray. I saw the results of a survey recently which suggested that very few Protestant ministers are satisfied with their personal prayer lives. Out of 860 Protestant church pastors surveyed, only 16% were very satisfied with their personal prayer life. 47% were somewhat satisfied, 30% were somewhat dissatisfied, and 7% were very dissatisfied. Now, it may be like that for everyone, but we ministers are supposed to be professionals when it comes to prayer, aren't we? Isn't that why people always ask us to say the blessing when we come to their homes for dinner? You're the professional, I'm just an amateur. But this makes me think if it's like this for the professionals, what chance do the amateurs have? So two years ago, I decided to do something about my personal prayer life. I I had fallen into this routine where I got up to make coffee early in the morning. I would put the coffee on, and while it was brewing, I would go into the living room and get down on my knees to pray. But then when the coffee was finished, so was I. I would get up, go in there, have a cup. I might do a little Bible study at the kitchen table, maybe post something on my blog, perhaps reach out to an old friend, but I wasn't really praying in the way that I was supposed to pray. And so two years ago, I decided to make change. I found that I was staying up too late in the evenings, usually watching something on television that was hardly worth watching. What if I went to bed an hour earlier, I thought, and got up an hour earlier in the morning to pray, which is easier said than done. But the next day I did it. I got up and I sat there in my chair in the living room with a fresh cup of coffee, wondering if I could pray my way through an entire hour. I needed some help. And so I used this guide to prayer, which I used back in my seminary days. And for every week, for every day, really, there is a plan that begins with an invocation and then a psalm that you use throughout that week and then daily scripture readings, readings for reflection that are printed right here in the book. And then you pray for the church and for yourself and for others. You spend some time in written reflection. At the end of the readings, there's a hymn. And if you're bold, you can sing it out loud. And at the end of it all, there is a benediction. I found that an hour was hardly enough to spend in prayer when I worked through this guide in the mornings. Maybe that's all I really needed, a guide to prayer. It sounds as if that's all the disciples really needed. One of them came to Jesus after he had finished praying and said, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Apparently, John the Baptist has taught his disciples some simple prayer, something that they could easily memorize, and they would walk around reciting it, making the disciples of Jesus feel inferior. They said, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples to pray. And Jesus was glad to oblige. He gave them something short, something simple, something you could write down on a three-by-five card and carry around in your back pocket everywhere you went so that when Jesus stopped to pray, you could just pull out the card and pray right along with him. We call it the Lord's Prayer. And in Luke's Gospel, it is a shorter and simpler version than the one we usually recite from Matthew. It goes like this. Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not 
into temptation. Five simple requests, one for each finger. Let's take a closer look at each one. First of all, Jesus asked his disciples to pray that the Father's name would be hallowed, that it would be made holy. And in these days when we pray that prayer, maybe all we are asking is that people would stop dragging the Lord's name through the mud, that they would treat it with respect, stop taking it in vain, that they would stop using it as a curse word. We pray for that time when everyone will speak God's name in hushed and reverent tones and relate to Him as a loving Heavenly Father. The second request is that God's kingdom would come. In his commentary on this passage, Alan Culpepper says, the preaching of the kingdom of God has been the driving purpose of Jesus' ministry. And there have been hints of its imminence. It's getting close. Jesus wants his disciples to pray it on in, and I believe to roll up their sleeves and work to make it so. The third request is for daily bread. And listen carefully, not a mansion, not a yacht, not a Rolls Royce, bread, daily bread, the staff of life. And if it's true that Jesus wants his disciples to work to bring in the kingdom, then it is also true that they will need their strength to do it. They will need daily bread. The fourth request is for the forgiveness of sins. For we also forgive everyone who sins against us, Jesus adds. Jesus did, apparently, but some of us don't. We need to be free of our own sins, but we also need to give up our grudges against each other. They weigh us down. They keep us from doing the work of the kingdom. Finally, we ask not to be led into temptation from a Greek word that can also mean testing or trial. Don't bring us into a time of testing, we pray. Don't let us be put on trial. But if we are, let us prove ourselves worthy of your name. In his comments on this passage, David Lowe says, the Lord's Prayer is pretty simple, really. After asking that we act in a way to keep God's name holy and live the kingdom life on earth, Jesus' prayer covers sustenance in the form of daily bread, relationship in the form of forgiveness, and safety, bringing us through the time of trial. These are the basics of life, he says, and Jesus limits himself pretty much to these essentials. In short, prayer doesn't need to be complex in order to be faithful. But think about it. For 2,000 years now, we have been faithfully praying the Lord's Prayer, and God's kingdom still hasn't come, not on earth, as it is in heaven. And I think that's the other reason that we disciples don't pray as we should. It's not only that we don't know how, it's that we don't believe it works. At least not for us, not in the way we want it to, not when we want it to. We pour out our hearts in prayer over and over again, and we can't always see evidence that God hears or answers. We get discouraged, and sometimes we just stop praying. But Jesus says, no, don't do that. Don't ever give up. And he offers two good examples and one strong exhortation to keep us praying. In the first example, Jesus talks about a man who needs bread at midnight. He said, suppose it's one of you. You need bread at midnight. And you go to a friend's house and you knock on his door and say, listen, I've had a visitor who came in late. I don't have anything to feed him for breakfast. Lend me three loaves of bread. And your friend upstairs, sound asleep, answers you in this way. No, go away. I've gone to bed already. My kids are asleep. The door is locked. Leave me alone. But Jesus says, if you keep on knocking, if you just keep on knocking, if you don't stop knocking, he will get up. Not because he's your friend, but because of your shameless audacity. 
Do that, Jesus says, and he follows it with this exhortation. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks to that one, the door will be opened. And then to illustrate that point, he gives one more example. He says, which one of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake? The answer, none of you. No father would do that. Which of you fathers, if your son asked for an egg, would give him a scorpion? The answer, none of you. Nobody would do that. And then Jesus says, if you earthly fathers know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the gift of the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? because that may be the best gift of all, the Holy Spirit, the thing that inspires us to keep on praying even when we're ready to give up and give in. So remember, Jesus says, this is not a friend you're asking for bread. It's a father. And it's not just an earthly father. It's your heavenly father. If you who are evil know how to give good gifts, how much more will your heavenly father give you what you need. Alan Culpepper says it's that first word, Father, that makes the rest of the Lord's Prayer possible. It establishes the kind of relationship that makes us able to ask. In Aramaic, the word is Abba, which means something more like Papa. Papa. Will you give me my daily bread? Papa, will you forgive me when I make mistakes? Papa, will you help me stay out of trouble? Of course I will. Of course. How could a father say no to requests like that, Jesus might ask. And if that's true for earthly fathers, how much more is it true for your Father in heaven? Now, I know that's hard for some of you to believe. You haven't had very loving earthly fathers, and you find it hard to trust your heavenly Father. I am truly sorry that that has been your experience, but it hasn't been my experience. I've been one of the lucky ones. Twelve years ago, I wrote up a collection of 70 things I remembered about my dad in honor of his 70th birthday. And I saved this memory for the very end. It comes from the spring of 1979, when I was 20 years old, taking a semester off from college to figure out what I was supposed to do with my life and looking for some guidance. It goes like this. I had come home for a visit from that farm in West Virginia where I had been working. I was planning to go back to St. Andrew's College in the fall, but Mom didn't think that was a good idea. She was trying to talk me out of it, and I was trying to talk her into it, and we had worn each other out with our reasons. I finally climbed the ladder to the loft to get some sleep, exhausted in more ways than one. And then sometime in the night, I got up to look at the fingernail I had pinched in a log splitter on the farm a few weeks before. It had turned black almost immediately, and in the days that followed, it throbbed, and in the last couple of days, it had gotten loose. As I tugged on it that night in the bathroom, it came off completely, revealing a grotesquely red and wrinkled nail bed, and I stared at it in horror. Finally went back to bed imagining that my finger would always look that way, that friends and family would shun me, that I wouldn't get to go back to St. Andrews, that I would have to work on that awful farm forever, and in a blubbering fit of adolescent self-pity, I cried myself to sleep. Early the next morning, Dad came creeping up the ladder to that loft. He was going somewhere and wouldn't be back by the time I left for the farm. 
he had come to say goodbye. And as he knelt beside my mattress there on the floor, I started to cry again. And I poured out my fears and my frustration. I told him about my long, hard talk with Mom the night before. I told him how lonely I had been on the farm. And finally, between sobs, I showed him my finger. <laughs> Is it always going to look like that? I asked. And he took my hand in his hands and he looked at my finger in the early morning light. And finally he said, you know, the nail bed looks healthy and pink. I don't see any signs of infection. I think it'll be just fine. And then he did something he hadn't done in a long time. He leaned down and kissed me on the forehead. I was 20 years old a junior in college. But in that moment, I felt like a little boy again. And my big, strong daddy was right there with me. And because of that, everything was going to be all right. And then I wrote at the end of the book, because of that, everything has been. Always. So when Jesus says that we can trust our heavenly Father even more than we can trust our earthly fathers to give us what we need, I feel my whole body relax. All my worries, all my fears begin to fade away because my big, strong heavenly Father is right here with me. And because of that, everything is going to be all right. And because of that, everything will be, always. Amen.